Hello. Uh, so this is Captain Australia civilian version here, uh, aka Simon. Uh, g'day, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I've pitched my hammock, obviously, and uh, it should start to get dark pretty soon. Relatively comfortable, so I've got a nice position, although it's a bit exposed, like there's a road just out. So yeah. Donna says, hi, Cap. Cap says, hi, Donna. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit exposed, but I'm going to trust to my luck. It's just a little country road off the motorway, and um, if anybody comes along and gives me a move along or a fine, I'll just have to deal with it. Murray says, hi, Cap. Cap says, hi, Murray. So, um, yeah, I've come about, oh, well, pretty much 37 kilometres today, and... Um, Tomorrow I'll turn in towards the uh, beach and head for a place called Hat Head. And then I'll follow, that's about 50k from here. And then I'll follow the coast down to Port Macquarie. I saw a sign that if I stuck to the freeway, I could be at Port Macquarie in like 82 kilometers or something. And I got really tempted to do that because I think the beach route after Hat Head, I think it's still probably a good 40-ish or more kilometres via the beach. I don't know for sure. It feels longer. Mick says, evening, mate. Hope you're well. I am, Mick. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, route via the beach and to the beach will be much more beautiful. Sleepy country roads, some beautiful beach, can have a swim. You know, it's the much more delightful path. But the freeway is the quicker path. And I've been missing my kids all day. And if you saw the Sookie video where I was trying to sing that song, so it was in my head all day, all day. But every time I'd try to sing it to myself, I'd get to this one line about, like, how. And now I'm going to gonna cry when I even just say the lyrics. Jesus. Um, how can I do this to you right now? You're over there, and I need you here. And it's about, it's a song by Powderfinger called My Happiness. And it's just been in my head all day and I've tried to sing it and I can't even get to the chorus, which is, you know, it's like, my happiness, slowly creeping back, now you're at home. And I can't get to it because that first verse has that line about, you know, how can I do this to you? And you're over there and I need you here. So it got me thinking about my kids, which gets me a bit weepy. You know, I, I miss my wife too, something fierce. But, it, you know, the kids, it's just, they're so young, you know. And this time is so precious. But we've invested it in fixing myself up. So that's what we're doing, as unconventional as it may look. So there's a lot of people, again, who've um, started to to check it out. It's a It, it is a tough song, mate says Lee, Lee. Well, tough meaning like emotional. Yeah, I, I, you know, especially if you miss somebody. Yeah, you know, like there's a lot of songs that have, I think, you know, they can they can be a bit of a kick in the guts. Like um, one that, that I've always found to be very hard to listen to and I've never lost a child, uh, you know, and I couldn't, I wouldn't have the tools to deal with it. Uh, but there's... Uh, you know Eric Clapton's Tears in Heaven? It's like, would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? And it's like he's singing, I think he lost a child. And you can hear it in the song and the lyrics, and it's just so painful. Anyway, um, and he's a, he's a lovely musician too, like in general. But... Um, yeah, that, that song to me has a particular power because of the story behind it. Uh, Murray says, you're doing a great job and your family will be so proud of you, mate. Yeah, uh, when I get back, I'm, I'll be a different person. I'll completely, I'll shave the beard off, wax some colour in my hair, reverse my age a good 20 years and we'll just, you know, maybe I'll even have a few rock hard abs after all the walking. So I'll be physically transformed. But more importantly, I think in my outlook, my sense of hope, my ability to take on what comes at me in life. Time after time, Cindy Lauper is a good one, yeah. Um, yeah. How's it? Lying in my bed, I hear the clock 
romantic and think of you. That's it, isn't it? Um, and so are we all. Ah, thanks, Murray. Mate, I'm, I'm never going to forget your kindness to me those early days in the walk. And I still, buddy, right here. Right here. That's your mother's blanket, mate. Keeping me warm every night, my friend. And I carry it with honour. And, uh, you know, it's. I hope it memorialises her in some small way, buddy. Uh, and I won't forget your kindness. The tarp I haven't put up tonight because I don't think it's going to rain. So I've got it down below covering the gear. Uh, so I can just have a nice breezy kind of relaxed hammock swing. Um, so, yeah, you know, music. I get music wrapped in my head when I walk, and I, I, the pack, the pack now, I have to lo- load it up with five kilos of water at least, and I'm running out of food. I need to stock up on food as well. All I've got left is uh, two protein bars and these salami bites, which um, Jai and Jules gave me from back at Wulgulga. Um, but, yeah, the uh, I get... The pack, I'm, I'm tolerating it wonderfully, even though it's heavier maybe than when I started because of all the water in there. And I couldn't cope with it when I started. But now, I mean, I'm physically getting stronger, no doubt. But I think, yeah, I'm more resolute as well. So, you know, I'm in it to win it and I'm pushing through no matter what. Uh, you know, it's only death or profound injury that will stop me. And um, or I guess, you know, border closures and all of that stuff. Uh, Shirley says, many, many people are there with you, Simon, in spirit. I, I thank you. I feel that. I really do. Like, you're, you're, you, you absolutely lift me up. One of the reasons that I am so transformed is that I think your kindness has amplified my healing. In it, or in it, Angie, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, music. Uh, I tend to, when my mind drifts off and I'm walking, I tend to get music. And it's weird. So there's the other day, it's all Motown. There's always a theme. It's all Motown, you know, or, or disco, you know, like, first I was afraid, I was petrified, kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. And then, like, there's all of these, like, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it, it's just relentless in my mind as I walk. So who'd have thought my, <laughs> all that Motown was tucked away in there? But yeah, I'll, I've got a little neck cramp at the moment. I get those since the chemo radiation, sorry. And it's like the sipping of the water for the saliva. Elton John, I'm still standing. Yeah, that's a cracker. That's a cracker. Um, the lovely Joe, who's sort of become Alfred from my Batman. She's still helping out and checking in and whatever. Um she she said, when I'm near the end of a uh, long walk, she'll text me and I'll be like, I have the tiger, Simon. I have the tiger. <laughs> and that is one of those songs too, if you want to, you know, kick in the bum and, and sort of refocus yourself. But, yeah, um, there's been, I think, some new people coming in to check check out what's going on. So let me uh, – I'll, I'll tell you about the big walk so far. Maybe I'll tell the whole story, you know, if anybody wants to hear it. So uh, where to begin? Okay, once upon a time, there was a a baby born <laughs> in Paddington Hospital in New South Wales. The midwife, did she know as she held that baby aloft? Did she feel destiny tingling in her fingertips? Did she know she held a future superhero? Probably not. Oh, there goes the cramp again. So uh, I had a... Um, my mother, when she was 15, uh, she was a very rebellious spirit. It was 1971, 1970, she got pregnant with me at the age of 15. And she also got into, like, counterculture, hippie culture and all that. And she just got, you know, snared by the dragon, you know, like uh, addicted to heroin, sadly. And um, that sort of tainted all of her young life, being a mother early and, and all of the rest. I, I think she had a state of arrested development. So, you know, fast forward through the childhood, like I moved around a lot. It made me resilient, uh, but it also made me a bit of an outsider. Um, growing up, I, you know, I would, I would develop a few very deep friendships as opposed to a lot of trivial ones. Um, 
and anyway, when I turned 15, the, the situation with mum, it just, it darkened, it, you know, it, it just, it was, it was a horrid mess. And I, you know, it's not her fault. Her life, her, her father beat her mother really uh, severely all the time. Uh, that's, I went down to live with them when I was 15 and that stopped that. So anyway, I, I left. I had to leave home. We were living in Brisbane. I was 15 years old and my life was broken and I, I had no particular hope for the future and I just had to leave. I had no money. I sold. I was into jiu-jitsu at the time. I sold my, my jiu-jitsu uniforms to another student. Uh, I had a little radio. I sold that. I think I netted a total of like $28 or something from memory. I think that's right because the walk took me 27 days and I had a budget of $28, which was about three baked cans of baked beans a day where I had worked out. Um, so, yeah, I just I got a pack and I hit the road. Donations are at 45560 mate, and going up. That's lovely, Murray. Thank you. So I got a pack, hit the road, and I walked from Brisbane to Sydney. I didn't actually get all the way to Sydney. I got to a town called Gloucester, which is like 100K north east or northwest of Sydney. Um, I didn't want to get uh, detected by police, taken into custody. I didn't want to get in, put into foster care, and I didn't want to get my mum in trouble. So I was very sort of furtive, you know. I, I think I, I was more mature, well, much more mature than my years, and I looked a bit older than my years, so I was able to just kind of um, go under the radar. And uh, I didn't hitchhike or anything like that because I didn't, again, want to get picked up by police or an axe murderer. And uh, I got to Sydney to live with my grandmother. And probably the, the single greatest thing about that trip was, I mean, it unlocked hope in me and it, it turned me into, it gave me a pathway to adulthood, right? But those, those are all for me. But when I got there, the beatings between my grandfather and grandmother stopped. I adored her, you know. So if there was one single reason why I could have done that, walked all that distance and all the rest, to, it's to spare her that violence. And uh, I, I'd, I'd do it a 100 times over. So I lived with them for a couple of years until my grandmother died of bladder cancer. And so there's a comment which I just want to look at because it relates to, hey, Captain, I live in Kempsey but heading to Hathead late tomorrow. Hope to meet you. There's a great food oh a food market. There's a great food market on tomorrow night. More than happy to f feed you up. Stay safe. Well, I'm running low on food, so I had it. I I thought it was like a tiny little, you know. Uh, there's like a caravan park and not much else. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I I got there. I lived with my grandmother and uh, my grandfather, who was a bit of an ogre. And uh, oh, let me plug the charger in because we got a battery issue. So this is the power bank. I connect this to a solar array which sits on the back of the backpack. It's at 88%. That means it can charge the phone roughly nine or ten times, which is pretty bloody handy. If it's a sunny day, I reckon I can be completely independent. No need for begging an outlet or anything. Uh, oh, no, have I wrecked this charger? No, oh, oh, sorry. I tilted the phone. Let me just plug this in. Pluggity plug. Sorry, guys. There we go. We are now juiced up. So, yeah, I, I lived there for a couple of years, and, and my grandmother died of bladder cancer, and then I left and went back to Brisbane. And, uh, you know, fast forward, got married, found my soulmate, had children. They, they taught me all about what love means, you know. Adult love's transactional, but I learned, I learned what unconditional love is, and I, I was able to apply that into my other loving relationships. They made me a better person. You know, life was good. It was all just, you know, suburban life. And then when I was 44 years old, my younger son was three. Uh, I started to get a lump in the side of my neck, and it was swelling, and I had a horrible cough, like a horrible cough to the point that I got explosive hernias which I still have, little bits of my outside that poke out through my belly button and the lining of my abdomen. And uh, I, I ended up, ultimately, I had a bunch of tests and stuff. I ultimately ended up referred to the ENT clinic at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. Uh, I was sitting in a room there where the uh, specialist had done a biopsy and told me that I had cancer. 
He said it was a stage four head and neck cancer. Uh, he, we talked about treatment options. He, he explained that there, there was a 40 to 60 percent success rate with uh, chemo, chemo radiation, and that it could be partially successful and reduce the size of the tumor, or completely successful and be curative treatment, get rid of the tumor. And if it was partially successful, that might unlock a surgical option because it was too big for any any kind of surgery, and it had advanced to my local lymph nodes. And without successful intervention, I'd be dead within six months. So, you know, went out, sort of got, got a will, <laughs> you know, last will and testament and all of that sort of stuff and, and just fought hard. That first weekend, I didn't know if it had metastasized to other parts of my body. Uh, if it had, it would have, it would have been, uh, you know, game, Red Rover game over sort of deal. So that weekend, I remember being weirdly cuddly with my kids and just spending a, it was like, uh, a weekend of anx anxiously not knowing, and it's one of the worst feelings in the world, to be honest. Um, and it's, I guess that's what I do. Like, if if I knew the world were going to end in three days, I'd be just, I'd cuddle my kids, you know? Um, yeah, head and neck cancer is really, really bad. Like, all, you know, well, cancer's a shit show all, all around, isn't it? But, um, and, you know, there are, there are horrible types of cancer, like breast cancers and a mess because it's so aggressive and invasive and um richard says you're an inspiration mate oh thank you richard that's a very kind comment um but head and neck cancer and its treatments specifically its treatments are the problem because i mean you've got to consider it's the apparatus you use to kiss to eat with you know to breathe to swallow <laughs> so the chemo radiation wrecks your saliva takes away your sense of taste causes ringing in the ears and all these facial cramps and all kinds of horrible messes. So, yeah, head and neck cancer is a bit of a train wreck, to be honest. Um, and, yeah, I, I did the chemo radiation. I, I, I had three months of pretty full-on treatment. Um, I drove myself to and from the treatments. I, I, there was a, there's a little secret spot near the RBWH where you can free park overnight, so... I exploited that when I went in for chemotherapy, went in, had my chemo, stayed overnight, got released the following day, drove home. Um, and I, I kind of kept it a bit on the down low from my kids. I, I just wanted to see if I got a lucky roll of the dice or not. And if it was if it was the dark, you know, path, then that's when I'd need to sit them down and prepare them. But during treatment, it was a bit on the down low. And, um, yeah, I learned at the end that I had had, just total metabolic response. So it appeared that they, they do a thing called a PET scan, which uh, it detects like microscopic types of pre cancer present in your body. And um, and yeah, that's right, Sonia. There's scars and all, all kinds of problems and head and neck, well, whatever part of your body really. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, PET scan at first was inc inconclusive because there was so much nerve damage and inflammation. So I had to wait an extra couple of months not knowing if the treatment had worked. But uh, two months later, I did another PET scan, anxiously waited, go into the doctor's office. And he was his name's Dr. Charles Lin. Uh, I think he's had a cancer as well. He, he has some infirmity, but he's such a sweet, lovely man, a Chinese, older guy and just such a wonderful doctor and human being. And he tells me, Simon, you appear to have had total metabolic response to treatment. And I burst into tears. I was, I was, thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for saving my life. And um, the thing is, so that's where the slippery slope started. So I celebrated my children. Uh, I went, we went on these massive road trips, rented these motorhomes. My travel insurance company, it's called Simply Travel Insurance. So it was uh, it was doing pretty well. Uh, I, I hands-on serviced uh, the business. So I answered calls. G'day, this is Simon. Uh, how can I help you? And because I, I, I have the qualifications to provide a degree of financial advice, I was able to kind of point people to what they needed rather than sell them what, what I wanted them to buy. And I think that ethical approach in business served the company well. So... Um, we had a lot of repeat customers, and so the business was thriving. That was great. 
It helped me get through the fight with cancer with a bit of financial freedom. That was great. Um, and we were able to go on a lovely holiday as a family. That was lovely too. But in my secret heart of hearts, at like 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd be there staring at the ceiling, wondering if I'd ever get to see my children grow up. You know, you know what I mean? Um, and cancer's like that. You know, if you're hit by a bus, you don't spend the rest of your life lamenting and fretting over whether you're going to get hit by a bus again. In fact, you probably think lightning doesn't like that, doesn't strike twice. You know, you do your rehab, heal up, you're good. I was actually hit by a bus when I was six, by the way. I got like eight eight stitches in the back of my neck. Um, or was it a tram? It was in Adelaide. I think it was a bus. Anyway, <clears throat> pardon me. So the next four years, the, the first year after treatment is absurd. It is horrible. Uh, so all of the side effects, uh, they really kick in after treatment and they accumulate. So, you know, uh, New Year's Eve on the first year after treatment, I, I, um, I was still, I was vomiting blood, uh, and the chemotherapy medicine causes constipation, and so there's blood downstairs, I have to get a colonoscopy to make sure there's nothing sinister going on there. All kinds of little problems with little solutions, yeah? Um, and you just navigate through them. The problem was cancer had broken my heart. And I, I didn't really acknowledge it head on. And it had sucked away my hope. And I didn't really understand that until it was too late. So four years later, I wake up. Uh, I realized, so I'd been piling on weight too because the chemo radiation wrecked my thyroid. Sorry, this is a long story, isn't it? Is everyone okay? Um, the chemo radiation had wrecked my thyroid. And uh, that, that regulates your metabolism. So... Uh, at the end of treatment, I was like 80 kilos or something. And by the end of the fourth year after treatment, I was 140 or 137.5, something like that. Uh, and that uh, added to my shame and distress and my existential problems. So I was, I was about as broken as a human being can be. I, I was just waiting to die. And I didn't want to look at that head on. Um, I, I, I had just... I'd been shying away from my problems rather than leaning into them, if that makes any sense. Um, no, thank you, Sonia. So I, I, um, I just came to a, a, like a, that rock bottom moment, that moment of clarity, and I realized uh, I had to make a change. And that afternoon, I, I had been walking to school to pick the boys up, and um, I remembered that walk I took. When I was 15 years old, I just, I hadn't thought about it in years, in years. And the impulse came on me that day, that day, uh, weighing 137 kilos, the impulse came on me to get a pack, get wifely permission, and just hit the road. And and some wisdom inside me said, yep, that's that's going to heal you. And I think that's all it takes, all it takes is hope, a bit of belief. It doesn't matter what it is that triggers it, and it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's the building of hope that's the essential ingredient to healing, I think. Um, you know, believing that a positive outcome is available to you. If you do the work, if you follow the recipe, if you cast the magic spell, whatever it is, hope. So I, I was picking the kids up from school, and I remember that big walk. And I almost left that day, uh, and I spoke to my wife about it, and she, she said, if, you know, if that's what you need to do, of course I'll support you. I'm, I, I know you're hurt, I know you're wounded, and I don't know how to help you. Uh, and I sat and I thought about it all day, and then I realized, hang on, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to walk, like, I don't just hit the road, I could, I could do a big walk. And shit. I could bring Captain Australia back to life and I could serve a charity and all those dots connected that night and I made this video uh, walking towards hope it's on it's on YouTube and it's linked down the bottom of the Facebook page and there I am fat old me the old me and it's like I declared it to the universe so that video was in part for me because I was asserting I will do this you know, so I was, I was backing myself and I was, it's like, 
You know in Peter Pan, how they can only fly if they believe in the magic of flying. It's like that. So by, by asserting an I will do this big thing, and, and like locking it in and locking it into my heart and mind, I started healing immediately. So it, it, it underwrote the hope. It backed it. And uh, it start, just started to build. So that night I walked three and a half kilometers, I think it was, and I got home and my butt hurt, my legs hurt, my knees hurt, my ankles hurt. I took a big bath and I felt like a champion. And the next night I did five kilometers and I felt like a champion. And the third night I did five kilometers. And I got to the end and I'm like, oh, this is hard, but I'm a bloody champion. And then I got to the end and it was almost like Captain Australia jumped out of me then. Um, because I just... I became my own slave driver, and I said, no, no, do it again. I'm like, what the hell, man, I need a bath and a teddy bear. Do it again. And I did. I turned like an automaton, just not in control of myself, wind up, a wind up clockwork soldier. I turned around, and I limped and struggled through the whole 5K walk that I'd just done. And that, the next night, I did, I did it again. I did 10K, and that became the new normal. So by pushing myself and believing in myself, I, I lost, uh, I'll say 50-something kilos in the first six months. And after that, I just sort of, you know, started eating normal again and just chilling out a little bit because um, I didn't want to go into the big walk underweight. I wanted to have a bit of reserve. <laughs> so, yeah, then, then fast forward to the actual practice walks. I, I started in September, I think, building the uniform and, Practicing these walks like Redcliffe to Brisbane, Brisbane out to Wellington Point and back again, Brisbane to the Gold Coast. And it's at that point where um, I thought, I, I need to find a way to promote this. My six-year-old son is watching and waving to you. Hey, buddy. Hey, what's his name, Angie? It's a pleasure. I'm sorry I'm not wearing the Captain Australia mask. I'm sure you'd like that, mate. Um, I, I wish I, it's not handy. I've got it tucked away in my pack. And I'm floating above my pack in a hammock. But hi, buddy. Um, so I did all these practice walks. It's Rafi. Is, do you say Rafi? Is that correct? Or Rafi? Rafi? We'll go with Rafi. Hey, Rafi. Hi, mate. Um, so, yeah, the, I, I realized I needed to then start, even before I started the big walk, to promote it. And I looked back at Captain Australia's old email. So that was an experiment in just, you know, can you make the world a better place? It was, I don't know what it was really. I didn't know what Captain Australia was for when I created it like 10 years ago. Uh, but it was a bit of a, a social experiment, I suppose. But I, you might know Jan Fran. She sometimes panels on the project and she has her own show. Um, she had written to me wanting to do an episode about Captain Australia on the feed. But I'd retired him because uh, my, my middle son had been when he was two years old, he started to develop some behaviours that uh, ultimately were autism. So I, I just said, no, nope, I quit. Let's focus on him. And um, But I wrote to Jan Fran because she was the last person to write to me. And I said, hey, Jan Fran, listen, you wrote to me 10 years ago. Sorry for <laughs> the delayed response. Um, you know, you were curious about Captain Australia. Well, I'm bringing him back and this is what I'm doing. So she, she took that into the producers of the project, and that's where that lovely story, which is now the sticky post, uh, that's where that came from. And that bit of media attention just sparked it all a little bit. It helped me get on the Today Show. And every time I get a little bit of media attention, that massively boosts the charity. So the underlying motivations of the big walk, okay, personal healing. But I think I'm actually all good, except for the physical stuff. So spiritually, psychologically, I... Actually, no, I'm still benefiting from that too. So I've been letting go of a lot of grief and whatever, but it, even just the endurance, uh, the, the physical ordeal of it is also toughening me psychologically. Uh, so yeah, I, I still am benefiting just in my own uh, self-repair and rebuilding. But the, the other, like the massive motivation was to help the charity. And in helping the charity, I amplified my own healing by being of service and also by... It's just like kindness is the antidote to suffering. So if I'm doing a good deed, it, it makes my own suffering less. 
Uh, so Sonia asks, can I use some of your photos for a piece of art? You can use anything. You have my blanket permission. Uh, any, anything at all that you people find on Facebook, you, even if it's like you want to make fun, you want to do a meme, a Captain Australia meme. Uh, in fact, like anything that you do could be of service to the charity. It could help because I'm not great at all this social media stuff. So if any of you are, you will really assist getting the, the charity, the donations that they need um, by doing any old thing with relating to Captain Australia's big walk. And Sonia, I'm humbled. If you're, if you're artistic and you uh, want to create something around Captain Australia or the Big Walk, that's delightful, mate. Of course you have permission. Don't be silly. Blanket consent, mate. Um, so, yeah, all that preparation, and then there, there are the motivations, and then I started. It was Boxing Day. It was my birthday. Uh, I don't like to say the exact age because then I, I keep getting texts from scammers and stuff, you know, like they're trying to steal your identity. If I throw out the, my, the day and month of my birth, and then some then someone figures out exactly how old I am. Bang, they've got my birthday. Next thing you know, they're opening a bank account. So I, I won't tell you exactly how old I am, but it's my birthday, Boxing Day. So like Bilbo Baggins on his birthday, I set out on my quest. There were wonderful people there. Um, the Today Show did another little uh, story on it. Nine News did an evening story on it. And um, some people walked with me over the initial bit through Southbank. And then a couple of guys on a bike and rollerblades came pretty much all the way towards Garden City with me, which are like a good 10, maybe 15K. But the first week of the big walk, and sorry, a long story, but let's push through. The first week of the big walk, it was an ordeal. Um, I, I was feeling the, the, the loss of my, you know, access to my family. Um, I'd overpacked. You know, I bought a wrench, a one kilo wrench, you know. Uh, I bought four costumes, all with different styles. <laughs> so I just, um, I made some imprudent decisions and uh, I needed to reverse them. The pack was, but the pack's heavier now than it was and I'm all good. All good. No problem at all. Um, so, you know. And that's still like, uh, my body weight now is probably, I don't know, I'll, I'll say about 90 kilos, so maybe below that, I'm not sure. Um, and the pack I reckon weighs 23 when it's fully laden with water. All good. No worries at all. Um, so let me take a quick look at some of the comments. Uh, oh, yeah, scammers, absolute gem. That's very kind of you. Um, so where was I? Yeah, the first week was an ordeal. Lots of rain. And I just wasn't making the pace that I had in mind. And I was bitterly attuned to the fact that I wasn't going to see my family for another at least two months. And the slower I went, the bigger that duration became. So I, I, I just, you know, mind, uh, no, sorry, that's, I, the only term I know is, I did a Jedi mind trick, yeah, on myself, but not a good one. And, uh, you know, I came good after I crossed the New South Wales border, I think. Uh, came down through Pottsville, Cabarita Beach and, and whatnot into Byron Bay. I mean, I was still bitterly sad about my, uh, my missing my wife and kids, but I was pushing through. I was plowing on. Where the weather was awful. The last few days have been incredible. It's just so dry. My feet are healing up. It's wonderful. But... Um, when I, when I was coming into Byron Bay, there's this inlet just north of Byron. I was following the beach, and the weather had been iffy, and the tide was high, and it was impassable, really. I, not in my condition with the big pack on my back. And on the other side, there was this family. And I, there was this guy, Billy, uh, from, from Great Britain. He just He's built like an SAS trooper. I'll say he's 6'4". And this dude... He went down into the middle of this waterway. He was like like Zeus come down from Olympus or, you know, mighty Hercules amongst mortals. And he just strode out to the halfway point. He said, come on, mate, I'll anchor you. So I did. I waded in and I grabbed his arm and like an old married couple, we made our way across. And that was probably one of the initial early high points for me, I think. Um, I'd met a... a 
it's a bunch of lovely people, but uh, yeah, for, he'll stand out in my memory. Lost my selfie stick in Byron Bay. I kept losing things. So I didn't mention Murray in the Gold Coast. I got saturated on my, it was my third night. Because I bought a tarp, but an uh, idiot that I am, I bought it for its colour, not its durability. So it was actually just like a, table, a birthday party tablecloth, and the colour matched those kangaroos on the costume. Idiot that I am. Um, and lovely Murray and Donna, who'd been watching the stream, came out and met me on the road and gave me a tarp to replace it. And Murray gave me this uh, blanket that I have right now, which had belonged to his mother, who had recently lost to cancer. And he'd asked if I could take it and use it to be warm. And it was a way of like honoring and memorializing her. And I don't know, fighting back against cancer a little bit, I think. So I thought that was, a, that was an incredibly sweet moment. And if, if you look down through the history, there's an early stream. So that was my first successful stream where I didn't miss a significant moment too. So we were able to capture it. So Murray and Donna are there on, I'm like three days into the walk. There was a lovely stream with them. Uh, but yeah, Byron Bay. Uh, and I pushed out of Byron up into the highlands, all these really expensive, be big, beautiful farmhouses. Uh, and that night, I, camped, I I was horrible, drenched. My feet were getting worse and worse. And I came across this little country school, uh, which was a, a, an incredible find. I know it's probably a, like a federal offence for me to sleep in a school ground. I don't know. But I didn't make a mess. I didn't do anything, leave anything, break anything. But I was able to find this warm little nook that was protected because a horrible storm hit that night. And I got doubly lucky because I was able to find a power outlet and charge up the power bank because the solar power solution just was not working. And the following day, I pushed down and, and eventually made it into Ballina. Um, met some lovely people, I bought some roadside bananas, I got given some delicious apple cake by a lovely family. And, and then anyway, I was just on this uh, like brick wall outside of Ballina, just moping because I was missing my kids. And this lovely woman jumps up on the wall next to me and says, G'day, you want a kombucha? And her name was Jo. And oh, it's getting dark. Oh, should I plow through? Let's plow through. Um, Anyway, she subsequently became Alfred to my Batman, really. But it's good, eh? You want a kombucha? And we exchanged stories and became fast friends. Um, she actually, my phone screen had been broken and I wasn't going to make it to the store in time. Couldn't get in a vehicle. And she, she offered to drive ahead, take the phone in there, bully them into repairing it first. And so that if I legged it, I'd get there in time to pick it up and it would be fixed. What a legend. So it cost me 120 bucks, but my phone was working again. That lifted my spirits. And she found me there in the shop. Uh, and there's another lovely stream in there where I share Joe with you. Because she, she has a friend who owns a motel in Ballina. And this was the first instance where I got offered hospitality. So I got this thing about sleeping rough. But I've also got this thing about um, never discouraging kindness. So, you know, hospitality, yeah, if a farmer says I can pitch a camp on his property, great. If, if someone says they've got a, a you know, a bed uh, or, you know, they'll, I can pitch my hammock in their carport or whatever, I'm allowed to say yes. And so this was the first concrete example of that. And I got to stay after, you know, a week of slogging through the wet with these horrible blisters all over my feet, wrinkly, <laughs> wrinkly feet. I got to stay in a comfortable motel room and um, do a bit of laundry and dry myself off. Uh, and that, I think, started a little bit of a pattern because although I've intermittently had to sleep rough, I've just had some incredible experiences with people as well. So anyway, out of Ballina, I, I continued down for um, McLean and Grafton. And little did I know, Joe was diligently ringing ahead of me. So she arranged a... Uh, I was able to pitch my hammock at a caravan park in McLean, That's the McLean Riverside Caravan Park, it was called. Uh, but then they came out because they said, mate, a storm's coming, come on, we've got a free cabin for you. So I had another bed. Um, and anyway, I continued into Grafton. And then randomly, I'm walking through south of Grafton towards uh, Coffs Harbour, and there's this farmer on a tractor, and he stops, he climbs down, and he says, hey, mate, you need a cup of tea, don't you? You look like you need a cup of tea. 
and his name was Quentin, and we went and sat on his porch. He introduced me to his wife, Taki, and I think we became fast friends. Like, they were lovely. Made me a cup of tea, gave me water, and um, when I got up, to, I said, thank you so much for your kindness, and when I got up to leave, they said, oh, what, you're not staying? And I, I was, you know, a, a wave of gratitude washed over me, and they had a bed. They let me stay there in their farmhouse. They trusted that I wasn't some psycho drifter dressing as a superhero to murder people in their sleep and whatnot. And, um, you know, I absolutely trusted them as well. And what, what sweetness that is, you know, that we're capable of that. So my quest shows that you can fix a broken life, but the, 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 the dealings with these people shows that we can fix a broken society too. You know what I mean? And the next day, uh, I get written to by Giant Jewels, and they're in a place called Wulhulga. And it's a march. It was like 60-something K, 63K, I think it was. And I made it, not until 9.30 p.m. I got there. Um, but they set up, they, they fed me, lovely, lovely, wonderful people, cooked, have a chat, and their dog, Bronte, oh, that dog. That dog could heal any wound in the human spirit. What a sweet dog. Um, so I stayed there, and we're getting towards the end. The next, next I pushed into Coffs Harbour, and... Um, I was a bit concerned about rough sleep in Coffs Harbour because, uh, you know, it's a very touristy town. And there's also a spike of homelessness, as there is in a lot of these small cities uh, on the way down. Um, I just, I, I didn't want to get into any strife or, you know, have a coastal ranger find me or anything. But little did I know, again, Joe and this lovely lady, Helen, uh, who, I'm an oncology mum, honor, honourable oncology mum, because... When I was doing my practice walks, I, I got invited to visit this oncology mum support group. And Helen is the lady who runs it. And we've become friends subsequently. And she's, she puts a concrete face on, on the whole charity thing for me. Sorry it's gotten so dark. Um, and, yeah, they'd been calling ahead. And they got in touch with um, this motel, Chelsea, the Chelsea Motor in Coffs Harbour. And they were just seeing if anybody, if anybody were inclined to put me up. They know I don't want to. Uh, it's got to be like an off, a genuine offer of hospitality, you know, and, and they were going to secretly sneakily pay for it. But the, the hotel said, no, no, no way. That legend, he can stay here for as long as he wants. How delightful is that, you know? Um, and so I didn't have to rough sleep in cost and they even offered me a second night. So my feet are, I've still got some issues with my feet, but the damage that was done from all the I walked through torrential rain, cyclonic rain. It was full on. Um, and I just walked and I kept on walking, plowing through, and I'd done some damage to my feet. But with that day of rest and the, the subsequent dry days on the way here, it's been great. And so, yeah, the last couple of days, it's just been down the, down the motorway and camping by the side of the road by the motorway. And then here we are today. And the motivations remain unchanged. Uh, Except more and more I'm learning that we, you know, we, it's not just me, it's we. Like, we are sharing in this now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, amazed, and delighted by that. And I'm sorry it's so dark. Um, I don't know if we can see up there. Yeah, the sun's definitely well and truly doing a fade. But we're at the end of the story anyway. So, here I am now. Um, and tomorrow I'll, I'll head off the motorway in towards the ocean and uh, get to Hard Hat where they've got a food festival. But yeah, the motivations still remain the same. So for me, it's personal healing and I continue to get stronger every day. So the physical sphere, I'm, I'm continuing to lose all of that just gloggy, entrenched kind of weight, that doughy kind of unhealthy weight that piled onto me. Um, I'm getting stronger with the pack, uh, my, my internal health, my breathing and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, intellectually, like I've processed a lot of stuff that I, that I had failed to in the past, let go of a lot of grief and, um, pain so that it doesn't burden me anymore. So emotionally and spiritually, I've, I've continued to continue to heal and that's great. The charity still just pushing through. I've got my big flag up every day. People see it. They, they come here. Uh, so hopefully we've got some new supporters coming in. And um, 
we've, we continue to get little donations coming in. And my hope is at some point, like maybe when I roll into Sydney, the TV networks will jump on it. It'll be theatrical and interesting enough that this old fool has plotted all the way from Brisbane to Sydney that they'll, you know, they'll put me on the morning show with Koshi or, or whatever. And those media pulses will really help surge the charity forward. And if there's anything that you guys can do or want to do, like Sonia asked if she can do some art using the cap, some of the photos and stuff on, on here, you, you absolutely flat strap go for it. If there are communities that you're in, if you're a, um, you, you might be in Rotary or something, anything, whatever it is, if there's somewhere where you can share the story, I'd be delighted and grateful, but don't feel on the hook as well. You're welcome here. Absolutely welcome to share in this, no matter what. You don't need to do anything. And that's the third part of it. Like, I've learned that some of you are really getting something from this, and I'm delighted by that. And I'm sorry, it's now Ninja Captain Australia. All you can see is these little reflective glasses, yeah? Um, and I, I'm just, I'm absolutely delighted by anybody who gets anything from this. And when I get to Federation Square in Melbourne, um, you know, in part, you'll have helped carry me there, you know, because it lifts me up. And I'm so grateful to that for that. And if there's anything then that, that you can take away from this, of course, you know, if me talking about my, my past pain or grief helps you to reconcile some of your own, that's wonderful. So that is now my third motivation, and it's probably, it has equal footing with the other two, being my personal healing and the charity. And there we are. That is the story from that momentous birth all those years ago in Paddington until this present day. Um, so yeah, let's have a little look at comments that I might have missed during my long rambling story. Kelso says, amazing story of a wonderful bloke. We're all with you. Well, thank you, Kelso. That's very kind of you. A very generous comment. You're not alone, says Angie. Thank you. Oops. Send an invitation to bring them on camera. How does that work? What does that do? Can't bring Matty Munyard on camera. The person you invited needs to download the latest version of Facebook. Okay. I didn't know we could do like a split camera and have a chat. Um, Sonia says, I'm so excited to be cheering you on when you get to your destination. Well, thank you, Sonia. And Lee says, we love you, mate. Inspiring every day. Such gratefulness is contagious. Ah, well, that's that's very generous and kind of you. I, I yeah, I can't tell you how, how grateful I am for your comment, buddy. Um, okay, now, I guess, sorry, I've probably jibber-jabbered for a good half hour, I suppose. Well, the sun's gone down. So I think, you know, the motorway noise isn't too bad here and no one's come to arrest me. So I might be able to chug a bit of water. And now I know, thanks to uh, uh, a lovely person following the big walk, his name's Chunk. I think he's a captain in the local rural fire brigade and he knows this local area. He sent me through some tips. And just up the road is a rest station with toilets and water. So I can chug down any of this water that I've got here and uh, eat these little bits of salami and then have a nice little nap, I reckon. Well, more than a nap. I hope to have a good 10 hour sleep. We'll just see how we go. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening to the story and uh, I wish you all the best. And tomorrow I should be able to show you some beautiful ocean and some beautiful country on the way there. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, what is it? Klybaka, uh Gladstone and then Hathead. I'm not sure, it's 50K to Hathead. I'll, I'll try and make it by the end of the day. But I might wind up sleeping somewhere near there and then rolling in in the morning. We'll just see how we go. So all the best. Thank you for your time. And Helga says sleep well. Thanks a lot, Helga. So good night, everybody. I'm sorry I'm currently invisible. Uh, Deb, good night. Angie, good night. Everybody, uh, rest well. Have a lovely night wherever you are. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Take care of yourselves.